you guys doing? Welcome to this edition of Motorcycle Madhouse Morning Mayhem. Hopefully you guys are starting out your week uh, without all the hangovers. But hey, that's the way it's supposed to be if you're hungover, man. Uh, how you guys doing over on Spotify and iTunes as well as YouTube, Facebook? And of course, we are streaming live, man, on WMM rdb in about a half hour man we're gonna finish up the second half of the show with some uh really really disappointing news of a guy who was convicted of rape and murder of a child he got released and we're gonna be going over that story we covered it once but we're really gonna get into it and i'll let you know how i feel over on uh, motorcyclemadhouseradio.com once we get on the radio station because god forbid we get uh any chance to keep the videos up on youtube uh we got one jerked again yesterday it's like becoming that's twice in a week that we got uh, videos jerked and it's getting ridiculous. That's why we actually started the second platform with the radio station. Even though, you know what? We're a radio station any damn way. Finally got our WMMRDB material in. That's what's uh, behind me right there. Yes, we're going old school again with uh, the backdrops and stuff. You know, I was getting tired of just uh, looking nice and na 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 na. We're only going live on the Hollywood and China Dolls show, so I can put my stuff back to where it needs to be. That is making me very happy. But we're going to be covering uh, this case of Pike and Portillo. And one of the reasons why I want to cover it again is just to let you know uh, a little more in depth on what happened in that case. I truly believe, personally, that they were routed, man. They were bent over by these damn feds and just, they were giving it. They they took it up the poop chute. And it's a sad state of affairs because it wasn't only the feds that went after them, but there was, uh, I think there was like eight uh, former banditos and associates that testified against them. And on a national level, and that's unfreaking heard of. Uh, I remember seeing this case when it was first coming out and stuff. I was like, you're kidding me. National Sergeant at Arms are doing this? And then you had that one guy who was in that History Channel uh, special about the Banditos, talking all tough about the Ditos and stuff. And next thing you know, he's cutting deals. He's cutting deals with... Uh, the prosecution and stuff, and then, of course, you got Romo, or Homo, as I always call them, uh, cutting deals. Uh, we're going to concentrate a lot on this segment about how rats are and informants and how they are really the ones that love playing the part until the piper comes calling. Now, I get a lot of comments uh, from people concerning this type of stuff with the rats and stuff, but the number one thing that they bring up is, well, you know, they were all chest pumped up when they were wearing the vest. And next thing you know, something uh, goes down and they're ratting like hell. And you know what? You got to take that point of view, man, because it's like, really, man? Everybody's going around talking badass about how this one percent of uh, club is or this one is. And next thing you know, you got informants all over the place uh, bringing these guys down. Now, uh, one thing that uh, the national uh, or the former, I got to say former, uh, president and former uh, national president uh, was trying to do was put reforms in man and we're going to talk about them reforms because during i guess uh the years before there was an interview i believe it was with portillo uh about how they tried to change things within the club one of them being that they didn't want no drug dealing they didn't want this it wasn't uh like it was in the early days they were actually trying to make reforms because everybody knows now that the feds, uh, they'll do anything they have to to get a case on you. And once you get in 
with the feds, you're looking at a 98% conviction rate. But the one thing that I cannot believe as a juror, if I was sitting on, on a juror and a case like this came up and you had somebody, and let's talk about the famous case. The famous of the famous rat cases. And again, I talked about this in Freddy's uh, thing. The feds made a deal with a guy that admitted to 19 murders. 19 murders. And that was Sammy the Bull Gravano. The biggest of the rats, man. And they made that deal with him so they can get at Gotti because they never could get at Gotti. You know, he wasn't called the Teflon Don for nothing. They didn't get him on taxes or any of that stuff. They got him on the RICO with all kinds of charges with the help of Sammy the Bull Gravano. Well, you'll see in here that the same playbook was at use to get at Pike and Portillo. You had guys that actually committed the murder, but they weren't as well-known as Gravano, so they didn't get a pass like he did. But instead of facing life, they got 18 years, or the one that was a national sergeant at arms only got five years. And you'll actually see it, because I'm going to start a video, and it's going to tell you about the whole case. The whole case at the beginning, and then the ending with the sentencing, uh, some newspaper reports from the time. Very interesting stuff, man. Very interesting stuff. And you know what? It's like in-your-face type of deal where a lot of people have to hear this stuff. You know, one of the biggest things that actually cracks me up is, and this is going on another subject I'm going to cover real quick, is people who think they're real by telling people we all got a kumbaya together. Now, one of the things is if you've been around a long time instead of maybe five or six, seven years, you're going to understand that there's a lot of history between clubs. And that's one of the things that started off this whole thing was, I guess... Uh, a guy was trying to start a Hell's Angel deal in Texas, and everybody knows Texas is Dito country, and that didn't go over well. So that's what started this whole case, and you'll learn. But those that are saying uh, that everybody needs to get along, we need to work again, you know, work together against the government, they're in fantasy land. That's Tinkerbell stuff. That's not going to happen. Clubs have been around decades. You know what? Real 1% clubs, real ones, and a lot of us old guys, we only consider 1% clubs that started decades ago, not ones that started 10 years ago or 11 years ago. No, that's not what we consider 1%. But, you know, this uh, Internet age, you know, everybody's a 1%er now. You know that? All these clubs that pop up, and I actually, I'll be covering that at a later on in the week about pop-up clubs, because you know how everybody goes and bangs on them, right? Well, I find it funny that they bang on them all the time when the clubs that they're supporting, that are major one percenter clubs, there is cases where they're flipping these pop-up clubs and you know what they flip uh, they've been flipping chapters of iron order if you can believe it you know i couldn't believe it when i heard of one chapter flipping to them and i was like damn i thought they were all bad and stuff but anyway that's a whole different thing i think the point is that in order to be real you got to give both sides of the story you can't go out there saying oh we all got to get along and not give the uh other side of the story on why clubs don't get along i don't know about you but when you have close guys with you close brothers that get their brains blew out by the other side that you're gonna forgive and forget well you know a lot of those beefs are you know Decades old. So, and your point is, your point 
you know what? Give me a good argument of, say, your blood uh, family member got blew away by this person. And you think you're going to forgive and forget? Hell, no, you're not. So those that are saying that we all need to come together for the MC culture, get the hell out of here, man. You know what? They're just pushing a bunch of load of crap on you. Now, there are organizations that are trying to come together and has been that a lot of these people don't talk about. And that's NCOM and NCOC. They're working together already to take on the government. But you don't know that because there's a lot of people that push fantasy land crap on you. That's not being real. It is, you know what? It really isn't. And when it comes, and I actually was talking about this in my, uh, you know, biker news uh, verse protocol until they jerked me on that one. It's probably because the hat I was wearing. My God, you know, this AI that they got over there now is, man, messed up. You can actually hear the episode over on Spotify and iTunes because, again, it got uh, taken right down. I think it was like two or two and a half hours after I put it up. But, you know, I was wearing my Peckerwood hat, and uh, I guess they didn't like that too much, so that's why I'm wearing my favorite hunting dog thing. But I talk about, because uh, there's uh, this dude's bitching about uh, the titles and all that kind of stuff. Well, the titles of our videos are taken right out of the uh, the article and stuff. In order to make things better, you got to acknowledge the crap that makes it worse. On everybody. On everybody. It's just not, uh, let's kumbaya and all that stuff. Uh, it, it it was funny listening to that one. It's like, dude, whatever. Are you shitting me? It's always, we need to come together. We need to come together. Start talking about NCOM. Start talking about NCOC. The organizations that are actually fighting back right now on profiling they're fighting with the government uh and that's one of the reasons why the government don't like a lot of clubs yeah they use all this bs uh you know the past and that's one of the things that it is it's the past and like in this one article uh he even said we're not your grandfather's or your father's banditos anymore he owned uh you know i think it was portillo he owned uh heating and air conditioning business he wasn't out there all gangster and stuff like these people would uh, let you uh, on to believe. They were calling him Texas's uh, Tony Soprano. But that's what they do to frame the argument. That's how they put it out to potential jurors. Now, luckily, uh, Pike and uh, Portillo was able to hire uh, real attorneys. But again... Once you're going up against a narrative that plays out in the news, it's hard to get an unbiased jury pool. Not to mention all these ex-members cutting freaking deals. You know, I really shook my head. I was like, man, this is terrible. I couldn't imagine what these guys were going through. Here you got, uh, you know... An ex-freaking sergeant at arms that was probably over at your house eating your dinner, breaking bread with you. You spent a lot of time with him. And next thing you know, he busts his on you. That's, a, that's really the biggest problem there is within clubs. And it kind of pisses you off. Because you see a lot of younger kids that don't take deals. Because they know, you know what, you don't rat. But then you have some of these older men, and I'm not talking old, old, I'm talking men, that were so supposedly the biggest badasses around, cutting deals and crying like little frickin' uh, bitches. And then you wonder why you see a lot of pushback within the scene against clubs. It's because they read this type of stuff. But, you know, that's just to answer that one question. Because you always see it in these comment sections, man. It's like, you're, you know, you're right. We need to all get along. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, man, give it a break. 
Really? Give it a damn break. It's old. It's not reality. But they don't want to tell you that. Right there's the clickbait right there. We all got to get along. <laughs> yeah, again, tell that to somebody who lost, uh, you know, one of their closest brothers. And, uh, you know, you have clubs moving in the territories that were never uh, supposed to go in there. And you wonder why there's wars. Uh, but anyway, enough of that uh, nonsense. Let's get into the main part of the show and that is discussing this case. I'm going to start it off with a news uh, segment where everything went down. And this is going to be coming out of uh, Case at 12. Uh, I believe uh, they're a news organization down there. So let's start her. Your old Jeffrey Pike from Conroe was also arrested. Their list of charges is not short, aiding in crimes through racketeering, which include murder, robbery, drug trafficking, and extortion. Also, conspiracy to commit assault with a dangerous weapon and conspiracy to possess with the intent to distribute 500 or more grams of methamphetamine. According to that indictment, the Bandidos gang declared it was at war with the Cossacks motorcycle gang in 2013. This raid, the culmination of the 23-month operation, followed the violence and drug activity that stemmed from that so-called war. Neighbors were reluctant to talk to us on camera today about the arrests, but say they've seen Portillo and Forrester at the home. Right there, the guy, uh, what's his name, uh, is getting in the van right now. The guy behind him is the National Sergeant at Arms. He's the one who turned. Eight months after that day right there. He's one of the rats. Home, now surrounded by FBI and DEA agents collecting evidence. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. All three men are still in federal custody, custody rather, and they will remain there without bond. If convicted, they could all face life in prison. Now you heard that, right? All could face life in prison. That's one of the reasons why old dude, now he was facing life in prison, but he ended up with only five years. Now, let's go to this uh, different article. It was at the time written by, uh, let's see here. Uh, where you at, man? Uh, where you at, man? Skip uh, Hollinsworth. And it talked about when he was interviewing Pike in 2007. Uh, he talked about how, you know, down to earth the guy was. And right here it says uh, he was told by law enforcement officers that Pike was Texas's Tony Soprano, a ruthless criminal who led the banditos with an iron fist. Then they went on an undercover agent uh, warned them to be careful around the banditos boss. Now, Pike. He, at the time, was a divorced father whose two children attended the University of Texas. Uh, he said he got up uh, early in the mornings, made the bed, walked the dogs, spent time restoring custom cars, rode his bicycle, the new girl took on his new girlfriend, and blah, blah, blah. Seems like a normal guy right there, doesn't it? Uh go into uh, some other stuff. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, because they've been going after him forever. Ever. Now, he talks about the rumors at first starting. Uh, they were arrested on, of course, racketeering and conspiracy. You heard that. Now, according to them, Pike issued secret orders to Petrillo about assault and murders he wanted to carry out in order to maintain control of the club's territory and profits. Uh, in turn, the VP ordered certain banditos to commit those crimes. In particular, the prosecutor said, Pike had ordered hits on bikers from other MCs, including an Austin man who was trying to start a tax uh, chapter of the California-based Hells Angels, one of the rivals. He uh, allegedly authorized a war on Kazakhs, you know, that's when the infamous uh, May 17, uh, 2015 Twin Peaks deal happened. 
And then the attorneys right there were talking about uh, how it was bogus. <laughs> it really was. Uh, but here is uh, the sad part of it. Uh, after the arrest, the prosecutors were pretty confident that they had evidence to bring down Pike and Pertillo. They not only had received a court order to tap the phone, they also persuaded eight banditos and former banditos to testify about the inner workings of the organization. Now, there is a key word there, persuaded, saying, you know what, we'll let you off for your crimes, man. All you have to do is testify against these two. That's who we really want. That's how it all starts. And that's where rats start jumping the ship and all the toughness goes away when the piper comes calling. Sad state of affairs. So now not only did they have the federal government against them, they had eight so-called uh, banditos and former banditos testify against them. Sad state of affairs. Sad state of affairs. Uh, now, I really like uh, this next thing where a lot of clubs are doing this, but the newspapers don't want to talk about it, and uh, sure to hell, law enforcement don't want to talk about it. He did, Pike, install some reforms. He demanded, demanded that his fellow banditos stop describing their girlfriends as property. He had some members kicked out for drug dealing. Does that really sound like what the feds were pushing about 500 grams of methamphetamines? He kicked, his, he kicked out people for drug dealing. Had other members kicked out for what he described as bad conduct. So they, you know what, they were actually starting to police themselves where the stuff that you see in the news all the time now with these rogue members, and that's what they are as rogue members. If you really believe an MC is a damn criminal organization like the mob, the outfit, or as we call it, the outfit, or if you really think that they're cartels, something's wrong with you, man. They're not. Their system is totally set up different than what a criminal, uh, like an outfit or something like that would be. Here they he put the reforms in. No drug dealing. But the feds, they charged them with it. Everything that he tried to do to reform the club to make it where the feds don't go at and try to change the image because, yeah, man, it was some hardcore stuff in the 70s and 80s. It really was some hardcore stuff. 90s, whatever. You know, people that weren't around for those errors, 70s, 80s, and 90s, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. There ain't no unity after them decades. When Pike gave interviews to the press, he'd like to say, we are not your father's banditos. He described his members as men who steered clear of the law, worked good jobs, bought braces for their kids, worked, uh, wore khakis and golf shirts when they weren't riding their motorcycles. He always mentioned that he, too, was living a crime-free life. He had married his accountant girlfriend. They vacationed on cruise ships together and posted pictures on Facebook. At Christmas, he'd do toy runs with other banditos delivering presents to needy children. Quote, we are not a threat. You leave us alone, and we leave you alone. Well, that's everyday life, ain't it? You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. They do work good jobs. All these members work jobs, man. Last time I checked, gangsters, you know, they're out there pushing the hustle. They're not over there even trying to hide that they're not working. Clubs are made up of hard-working individuals. 
what happens is that the feds, law enforcement, and you know what? I have to say, the clubs themselves, they live off the reputations of what happened in the past. And the cops use that against them. That's why a lot of these people are listed on the DOJ website as criminal organizations. It's because of what happened in the past. And you had a guy here that was at the national level trying to change that. He don't want no drug dealing. Because what's that do? It brings cops down on everybody. He kicked them out because of that conduct. Does that sound like an Frickin' gang? No, on the flip side, what it happened is you get your ass killed for not producing the, uh, your weekly vig, man. But they don't want to tell you that in this. They are normal people now. It ain't the old days. Everybody knows technology can't get away with everything. He even did away with the large El Presidente patch. Now, it is my understanding, I might be wrong on this, you can correct me, that there was a split between the United States and the crazy Aussies. And I believe that split had to do with all the crazy Aussies that, that you see in the news all the time, we covered extensively, Playing that gangbanging crap over in Australia. They call them Nike bikies. And you know what? They're not MCs over there, especially with them type of guys, man. They're over there running some hardcore stuff. And I'm not going to sit here and pull your pecker and, you know, buy into this government conspiracy of, uh, well, they're just a motorcycle club over there. Bull crap. They're running around with $1 million freaking uh, homes. They're running around with freaking uh, $500,000 cars, $100,000 bikes. Yeah, you're not making You know what? Use common sense. Again, don't bullshit the public. They're not that damn stupid. And you can't blame it on a conspiracy theory either, man. You know, that is actually one of the things that really hurt the scene as a whole, especially when it comes to profiling, you got these damn rogue members that want to go out there and do their hustle. They do it under the guise of them being a club member. But what happens is, just like he said, with the reforms, we don't want it in here. There's too much technology now to catch your ass. That's why you're seeing a lot of the beefs that are happening go more underground. No, <laughs> we're not even keep on that subject. Anyway, now let's take Romo here, our homo. This is one of the guys that testified against Pike. He was facing a life sentence. But he only got 18 years because he worked with the prosecutors. He went and said, uh, you know what? Screw them two, man. Uh, I'm going to get a deal here and claim that they ordered everything. Come on. You know, most leaders, most officers, they take the lead in stuff. Remember that. Uh, Guillermo Contreras, he was one that covered this thing to a T. To a T. There's the homo. Uh, he, killed the mem he killed the members of the Hells Angel in 2006 to gain membership in the Rivals Motor or Banditos Motorcycle Club. Uh, he was sentenced to 18 years in prison without parole. Uh, he was a uh, homo at the time, uh, 45 testified at the trial for the Bandito's former two top leaders that he was the trigger man in the March 2006 shooting of Anthony Banesh. He was slain outside a pizza restaurant. Now that killing went unresolved or unsolved for 11 years 
uh, until authorities in early 2017 developed information that led them to charge Romo and three other banditos, uh, his older brother Johnny Downtown Homo, who was a Rankin National Sergeant at Arms in the Banditos. Man, that's not a, you know what, that per, that's, uh, you know, jinxing people having that position. Uh, like Romo, uh, Robert Romo faced life in prison without parole, but prosecutors asked the U.S. District Judge David Isra for reduction. The judge gave Romo 18 years for murder in aid of racketeering and 18 years for using aid and discharge in a firearm. Now they're running concurrently. His brother, Romo, he pleaded guilty to the same charges and received a sentence of 15 years. 15 years. See the big cuts? Now, at the trial, the brothers testified that the hit on Benesh was ordered by then Banditos National President Jeffrey Faith Pike, and the directive was passed on to Johnny Romo by Portillo, who was the National Sergeant Arms in 2016 and went on to become the National Vice President. Uh, they talk about the crime and all that type of stuff. Uh, but they're claiming off the words of a bunch of rats and informants to reduce their sentence, which the jurors should have took into account, that they have been ordered to do that. They took the word of a bunch of rats, informants, whatever you want to call it, to get their sentences reduced. I think that should be illegal in the United States. You know, but hey, we're the country that lets a guy off that, uh, you know, killed 19 people. Uh, they were uh, rewarded, they testified, by being made full patch members of the Banditos. Now, here is where it all breaks down. If you're going to kill somebody, if you're an organized crime deal... You're not going to have people that are non-members do this kind of stuff. You're just not going to have it. Do you think a national is going to be talking about uh, to people to go knock somebody off if they're not even a member? Does that make any sense whatsoever? But I don't think those uh, jurors understood that. And then they were made a part of a squad called the Fat Mexican Crew. <laughs> See, that's where it don't make no sense. If he's Texas's uh, Tony Soprano, do you think he'd be stupid to use people he didn't have in his own organization? Stupid. Stupid. Now, let's talk about this other run. The one that you've seen being arrested with Portillo, I believe it was, or Pike. I, You know, I couldn't see it right at that time. A former high-ranking member of the Banditos who was the first to publicly testify. He was the first one to jump ship. The first one. He only got a five-year sentence. Justin Cole Forrester. He's probably a witness protection by now. You probably ain't going to see his ass. He's gone. He, quote, took responsibility for his actions, and he's truly sorry for him. You're truly sorry for ratting against uh, brothers that you sat there, ate meals with, probably uh, got to know the families? He's ready to put this behind him. Yeah, because, uh, you know, you ratted. You got your five years instead of your life sentence. He wants to be a contributing member of society. Well, where was that before all this supposedly went down? The judge noted that he was no meek and mild participant. This was no Don Knotts. He engaged in some criminal activity and re readily acknowledged his role. Fortunately for him, he never engaged in any direct activities resulting in the loss of life. Like so many other banditos did. You're going to say that, but you're going to give these rat informants 18 and 15 years? 
My God, that burns my ass right there. Trust me, that one burns my ass. Uh, he pleaded guilty to racket spe uh, racketeering conspiracy and three related crimes and turned state's evidence eight months after he was arrested, along with the club's two top bosses. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, this Eric Fox, the U.S. attorney, he's all gleeful right now, man. To our knowledge, this was the first time anybody had testified against uh, the Banditos. When he testified, there were a number of Banditos in the courtroom that are in our eyes. Yeah, in your eyes. Let's get some narrative going there, man. <laughs> we're there to intimidate. That's what Pike and Portillo, or Petillo, or if it's a Spanish thing, were facing during this stuff. It was a three-month trial. Three months. And they had the cards stacked against them from the beginning. People run to run and make them deals. The feds, we already know how they are. But I'll come back to that. Here's the ending of what happened. The is now in two top former banditos, National President Jeffrey Fay Pike and ex-Vice President John Xavier Portillo found guilty in a 13-count indictment. Their crimes ranging from murder and extortion to racketeering. Our Bill Barajas tells us both are now waiting on the sentencing phase. We've heard a lot about the split on the far right, the old patch. These vests and their like patches the are just some of the 1,200 pieces of evidence in the almost three-month-long federal case. A San Antonio jury finding former Bandito's national president, Jeffrey Faye Pike, and national vice president, Xavier Portillo, guilty. It wasn't just these two guys that went to trial. I think we ended up charging in the teens of number of Bandito's people, many in leadership positions throughout San Antonio and elsewhere. Pike and Portillo were found guilty of federal racketeering related to multiple murders, attempted murders, assaults, extortion, and drugs. Assistant U.S. Attorney Eric Fuchs says the case has shaken up the Bandito's organization. I certainly have heard from sources from our own law enforcement sources that uh, it has had a dismantling effect on the Bandito's organization just over the last three years. Not the verdict itself, but the, the entire... Um, prosecution effort and law enforcement effort. Law enforcement expects the organization to continue operating, but the FBI says this sends a strong message to anyone at any level breaking the law. That no one is above the law, that no matter how much insulation you think you may have from these criminal and violent acts, that we're going to do the hard work, we're going to collect the evidence. Hmm. Going to collect the evidence. What evidence was there except for freaking... A bunch of rats. Think about that. What evidence was there? Here's people that were trying to reform everything. And the feds just couldn't let it go, could they? So that's the, you know, what they had to face. And yeah, well, you know, I've been getting emails about uh, covering other cases and stuff. I'm going to look into them and... You know, but this is one of the big ones that uh, happened in the last couple years, that and Freddy uh, with the Pagans. They all have one common denominator, and that's the informants, that's the rats. Sad state of affairs, man. Uh, but we're going to go and finish over on MotorcycleMadhouseRadio.com. We're going to talk about that one case uh, with that child molester and uh child killer uh china doll is going to be coming into the studio in a second don't forget to download that xena app man get her done we'll be right back after this commercial break <laughs> 